today. Network television specials and best-selling books are causing Christians and non-Christians to ask many questions about the accuracy of the Bible. For example, how did the early Christians know which books to include in the canon of the New Testament and which to keep out? What about the other missing Gospels that never made it into the Bible? And if we don't have the original manuscript copies of the New Testament books that the Apostles wrote, how do we know that we have what they originally wrote? And how can we know what Jesus truly said if church scribes intentionally tampered with the words in the scriptural text as they were handed down to us? Well, today you'll find out. My guests on The John Ankerberg Show are two well-known scholars. First, Dr. Daryl Bach, professor of New Testament research at Dallas Theological Seminary. He has appeared on NBC, ABC, CNN, Fox, and the Discovery Channel as an authority on the historical Jesus. Second, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace, one of the world's leading authorities on textual criticism and the Greek manuscript copies of the New Testament. He is director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, is the senior New Testament editor of the Net Bible, and is professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. Listen as they present the evidence that every Christian needs to know to answer the questions of those who are trying to discredit the Bible. Welcome to our program. Let me ask you this question. How do you think that the early Christians picked out the 27 books that now form the New Testament canon? I'm sure that you've been listening to television, you've been reading books, you've been hearing specials on uh, television that talk about a myriad of ideas of how that information came down to us. Some say that uh, we lost all the original stuff that the Christians said and uh, Constantine had uh, the scribes write up a new one uh, in the fourth century. Uh, others are saying, no, but it wasn't that bad, but it, we don't really have the good stuff. What we want to ask these men who are leading scholars in the world is how do you answer that question, especially to students that are listening. Daryl Bach is professor of New Testament research at Dallas Theological Seminary. If you look at him carefully on our show today, you will recognize that he's been on ABC and NBC and Fox and CNN almost every time you see a historical special about Jesus. And Dr. Daniel B. Wallace is professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's one of the world's leading authorities on textual criticism and the Greek manuscript copies of the New Testament. He is director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. He is the senior New Testament editor of the Net Bible in his spare time. He has also written Standard Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, an exegetical syntax of the New Testament. These are the top guys. Dan, let me start with you. How did the early Christians pick out which books would go into the New Testament canon? That's a great question, John. I think there were three basic criteria that they began to think about as they wrestled with what goes in and what doesn't go in. The first one is what we might call apostolicity, or we might call it antiquity. And apostolicity means is it written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle. But if we add the term antiquity, it tells us it has to be written before A.D. 100. It has to be a document by either an associate of apostle, an apostle, or one of those eyewitnesses or second generation Christians at the very most. Or it didn't have the credentials. Or it didn't have the credentials. And you get a lot of scholars today to say the, the canon was wide open until the fourth century or fifth or sixth century, which means there's no closing of the canon. It means there's no, no one who says these 27 books and only these 27 books go in. Well, the impression that the untrained reader is going to get from that is that, oh, then that means they could have picked uh, the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Peter, you know, all sorts of documents that came around in the, in the second century, some of the Apostolic Fathers' writings, they could have put those in the canon, but that's not true. The fact is that the church began to realize very early on that it's only those documents that uh, had the, the mark of apostolicity or antiquity. You get the Muratorian fragment, which I know we're going to talk about later, but in the Muratorian fragment, it says, in our time, the shepherd of Hermas was written. And he says, in, in our time, so he's talking about the uh, second century. And he says, this is a good book. And, and it was. It's one of the Apostolic Fathers' writings. It's a good book. It's edifying. But it shouldn't be read publicly in church because it doesn't have the same stamp of authority as these other books I've talked about. So there's a demarcation that says, A.D. 100, 
No, mo no more is this possible to be in the canon. Before AD 100, it is possible. The second criterion would be Catholicity, and that doesn't mean that it's Roman Catholic, it just means that it's universal. It's a book that would have been accepted by the churches, and from the tradition of the apostles telling, uh, teaching these bishops who then train other bishops after them, right on down the line they say, we know this goes back to these men. We know that this is telling us what orthodoxy is about. This goes back to the apostles or goes to their friends. We know that this is a book that is really telling us what, what Scripture is all about. And, and we recognize that even in the second century, the fact is they were concerned about that issue. That's what they said. Yeah, they, they, they were concerned about the authority of the apostles in the first half of the second century, I'm not so sure they even recognized that much that the New Testament should be regarded as Scripture. That's a different issue I think we'll take up a little bit mm -hmm. later, I suppose. But, but uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the authority of these documents, it had to be something that was widespread, accepted by the churches. And then the third issue is it had to be orthodox. That is, it had to conform to the other books that we knew would already be telling the truth about Jesus. Darrell? Well, and I think the important point about the third category, this idea that it had to be orthodox is, is that you had the teaching of orthodoxy in terms of what its core was moving through the church in the way that we've already talked about on earlier shows. That is, through the, through the schooling, through the doctrinal summaries, through the hymns, through the singing, through the sacraments. So that, so that there was a rule of faith, what sometimes used the phrase regula fide. There was a rule of faith, and these books lined up with that. Many of the books that ended up not being in the canon, not being recognized, had problems with the regula fide. They had tr trouble with the rule of the faith. And so they were excluded because of their content. Let's stick with that point. What made some books unorthodox, and what was the core beliefs that the Christians held to that uh, made them reject everything else but these books? Well, the core beliefs that exist had to do with God being the creator, that that creation was good, that Jesus was both really truly human and truly divine, that uh, the creation was something that needed redemption, uh, and not just, not just the person, not just their soul, but even down to the material elements, there was something physical about uh, the creation that needed redemption. And even creation itself groans for redemption. There's a famous passage in Romans 8 that says that the creation itself groans for the redemption of the sons of men. And so, so there's this idea that that, that that salvation is going to extend to the entirety of the creation. Um, that the resurrection is, has a physical element to it. That it's not merely immortality of the soul or something like that. So when these extra biblical documents hold to a creation that is flawed at the beginning, that God isn't directly responsible for, but some underling God is, that uh, Jesus is oftentimes not completely human. Usually the problem in the early church wasn't the belief that Jesus was divine, interestingly enough, it was the problem that Jesus wasn't human enough. You know, he left footprints in the sand, but it was more an impression. <laughs> uh, that his soul or left... that he never even left footprints that, that, in the that's sand. Exactly right. Yeah. Or that he walked on the beach and there were no footprints. That when he died on the cross, his presence that was, that was residing with any human body left, so he never genuinely suffered. Uh, the moment you did something like that, you are out of here. And then uh, the idea that there is no physical aspect to the resurrection, out of here. And so uh, there are certain elements of content that disqualified these books because the teaching that the church had already established even before, uh, in many cases, these books were even written, uh, had been passed on and they knew what that was and so they said, this doesn't match up. All right. I love that. Let's go to the fact of when were certain books included. A lot of talk is about the Gospels, the four Gospels. You know, Dan Brown uh, had that uh, whole deal in the Da Vinci Code. There was really 80 Gospels and only four were picked out and that was political and blah, blah, blah. The fact is, let's talk about what actually happened in history. When did the early church start to recognize? How early did they recognize these four Gospels were the four Gospels they were going to include? Well, if you start with Dan Brown's list of 80, I have no idea where he got that number. For one thing, we're not really sure how many Gospels there were that were uh, circulating. However, what he's also suggesting is that this belongs in the earliest period when it doesn't. What we have in terms of documents are the four canonical Gospels from the first century. After that, we have Gospels that are written in the second, third, all the way up through the ninth century. And if you count all those documents from the second to the ninth, is it e even to the eleventh maybe? For one of, I know you have pseudo-Matthew that's ninth century. Uh, we're talking about 45 to 60 Gospels, something like that, but they're all later. That's the point. 
Now, that's the first thing I would argue is that let's look at the earliest materials we've got, those four Gospels. And one of the things that uh, many people don't realize is that the, the modern book form we have today that is binding on the left side where you turn the pages, it's called a codex. That was invented probably the last decade of the first century. And we, we have very firm evidence that it was Christians who popularized this first and they just took off with it. For the first five centuries A.D., Christians had 80% of their books written on a codex, while as the rest of the world had only 20% of their books on a codex. So the Christians were the ones who were really using this far more than others. And uh, some have suggested that perhaps the codex form was invented because it could incorporate more than one book, while as a, a roll or a scroll could only have something like the size of Luke in it. You couldn't put all four Gospels on it. So there's a, a suggestion that the original codex form used by Christians was to put all four Gospels on it. And therefore, you're able to spread this collection and get the news out about these are the books that we actually uh, prize and, and uh, treasure. What are some of the statements that stand out to you as you go from the apostles to their students to the students of the students? And then you get these church leaders that are coming down the pike in this flow of consistent doctrinal belief. When did they start making statements to the effect that uh, we recognize we've got four Gospels and four Gospels only? Okay, well, what's happening in the second century is this. If you look at the early portion of the second century, talking now about the apostolic fathers, the generation that begins with first Clement, you know, studied under an apostle, but, uh, but not an apostle themselves, and go to Justin Martyr, who's generally called to be the first of the apologists. There's a collection called the Apostolic Fathers that represent those books. If you look, and they re generally represent the early part of the second century, first half of the second century. If you look at those works and you ask, ask how often are books that now end up in the New Testament, how often are they cited, the answer is not as often as you would think. Uh, they're, they're not cited that often. Now, there's a lot of material that's like what we see in the New Testament in there, so sometimes we can't tell, are we citing a biblical book, or are we citing uh, a representation of the tradition that's represented in the biblical book, that kind of thing. That's not to get more complicated, but it's simply to say that people aren't citing books yet, they're simply presenting theology. We get to Justin Martyr and we get to Irenaeus. What's happened is, is that other movements have started to surface. As other movements have started to surface, they're writing books themselves that they are treating as authoritative for their kind of theology as a way of, of buttressing their theology. And so now we've got to begin to ask who's got the real deal and who doesn't. And so that process of dialogue starts to happen and you start to get a sense of, of what the books are that represent what we believe. All right, uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to continue this and uh, actually give the time periods leading up to the Council of Nicaea and later on Athanasius where he said, this is it. How did they get from, we got these books, to sorting them out and down to this is it, okay? And how early did some of them get to this is it? All right, we'll talk about that when we get right back. All right, we're back. We're talking with two of the great scholars in the world, Dr. Darrell Bach, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace, and we're talking about the key question, how in the world were these books that form the New Testament canon today, how did the early Christians know which to pick out? You have this information coming down from the apostles and from the companions of the apostles, but somewhere along the line, they said, this is it and this is only it, and it became the canon, the authoritative books that the Christians held to. And there was a way of saying, this other stuff is not part of that. All right, pick it up right there. How did they include this stuff in? What were the marks in history that tell us this? Well, we begin with Justin Martyr, who actually begins to cite these works in, in extensive portions. And it's, it, it, there's no debate. It's coming from this material, etc. And he's using it to buttress his argument as he's defending Christianity. Then you come to someone like Tatian. I like Tatian. Tatian had a great idea. He said, you know, it's confusing to have four Gospels. Why don't we tell it in one story? Let's have one mega Gospel, and we'll call it, you know, we'll call it the Dia Tesseron. Now, that doesn't mean anything to anyone because no one knows Latin, but if you know Latin, it means through the four. So what he does is he combines the story of the four, plus a few other things, puts them into one running account, and issues it to the church as the new industrial strength gospel that tells the story in one sitting. And it's supposed to simplify things. 
And although it did get picked up for liturgical use in certain contexts and was pr and proved valuable to the church, it never replaced the four Gospels. Why? Because the four Gospels were too well established to be replaced. And so that's in 170. In 180, we get Irenaeus writing. He says there are only four Gospels. End of story. Um, so that by the time we get to the end of the second century, we have the core of the canon in place. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, the canon wasn't fixed until the middle of the fourth century. Technically speaking, that's correct, but it's also misleading because 20 or 21 books of the New Testament, by the time we get to the end of the second century, are in place. We have our four Gospels. We have Acts. We have the many epistles of Paul. We probably have 1 Peter as well. And so you put that all together, that's a, that's a huge core collection that's in place by the end of the second century. Then the rest of the discussion that runs out until the middle of the fourth century is about books that were perceived for one reason or another to be on the fringe because there were questions about them. The books were short or they were a little different, like the book of Revelation, um, short like Philemon, Jude, uh, Second Peter, Second Peter and Jude are a little more apocalyptic, so that's a little different. So that's a little. So it took a while for those to settle in. Plus some other books that didn't make it in: First Clement, the Didache, Shepherd of Hermas, which some people at certain points treated as authoritative, but never got the corporate recognition right. that the other books did. And so eventually we come to 367, Athanasius writing what's called a festal letter, and he names the 27 books, and then that gets re reasserted or reaffirmed in councils that, stint, that extend to the end of the 4th century and the beginning of the 5th century. All right, go back, though. The fact is we started this whole series of programs where we say, and there was Jesus. He picked out 12 guys. Those were the apostles. They preached the, preached the Pentecost 50 days after Jesus was put into the grave, and then they were the living apostles, and they wrote the letters and books. All right, now, when you get down to what's in the canon right now that we're carrying around, the New Testament, all right, that Athanasius said, this is it, boy, nothing else gets in there, and what you're saying is uh, basically was already in place by the end of the second century. Long before Constantine, that's important. Mm -hmm. That's the key point. Okay. <clears throat> but the fact is, go back to where the sources of these books. It's really mind-blowing when you say this. Just, mm -hmm. just spit it out here. Well, the, the, key source, the key source that lets us know that this is in, beginning to fall into place at the end of the second century is Irenaeus. He's writing and, and describing the four Gospels, and he says, now he makes an argument we would never make, okay? It's a rhetorical argument. He basically says, just like there are four corners, the four winds of the world, so there have to be four Gospels, you know? So, but the point is it shows how well established this is. This, this is like nature, okay? <laughs> That's what he's saying. He's, and, not, he's not coming up with something new. This is, he can't just make that kind of a statement up. It has to have a long tradition It has to have something before. rooted in truth. Well, people, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, it's not mm -hmm. just four. I, got, well, I know about five, six others over. Mm -hmm. No, he's, the only way he can get away with making that statement is because it's got to reflect something like what's But there were nine on. sources that the 27 books came out of. What yes, were they? Yes, they are they're basically nine people who contributed to what ended up in our New Testament. They are Matthew, Mark, Luke is responsible for Luke Acts, John, respons uh, responsible for the Gospel and Revelation, the Johannine Epistles. Some people will dispute that, but many people think it's all one person. Uh, you've got uh, Acts that's tied to Luke, so you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and of course Acts goes with Luke. Then you've got Paul, and then you've got uh, James, You've got the author of Hebrews, as Origen says, only God knows who that is. And then, uh, and then you've got Peter. I think that's it. I think this is the Jude. 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 Jude at the end. Okay, so nine people contribute these 27 books, basically. They were either apostles or the companions of the apostles. End of the discussion. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. What else would you contribute to this in terms of how would students know this is correct? They picked out the right stuff. I think you have discussions of the authorship of these books that goes very early on into the second century. We have discussions from Papias, we have discussions from Irenaeus that go beyond that. Ignatius talks about the apostles, Clement does. And those discussions are, are telling us that these books were, were written by these people. And even though they did not yet perceive of the New Testament as Scripture, uh, not, not at that early stage, they are still saying these are the authoritative guys who wrote this stuff. And one of the things for us to wrestle with is uh, today if someone came along and said, you know, there's 66 books in the Bible, but I think I want to add a 67th, and I just wrote this thing, who should I get this published with? And you get some people that are probably should be put in an asylum that are making those kinds of claims every once in a while. But when you get the New Testament documents, it would be that kind of 
a, a statement as well. How long is it going to take for the church to say what we have today is in addition to our complete Bible, namely the Hebrew Bible? By the second century, they're already viewing that Hebrew text as, as a complete text, and now you've got New Testament d documents. All right. Again, the contemporary question is, didn't the powerful write history the way they wanted it to? What's your response to that? I would say it wasn't the powerful who did it, but it was those who knew the truth and conveyed the truth and persuaded people because the message that they had was so unbelievably persuasive and because it changed lives. And I think it's important to recognize that the core of this canon is in place before the political powers of Rome are Christians. So, exactly. so, so that we've got, we've got this period at the end of the second century where Irenaeus and others are writing, certainly in defense of orthodoxy, they are bishops, they have some authority in the church while there's a larger discussion going on. But what would cause that to be persuasive? What would cause that to be persuasive is that that material and those claims are rooted solidly in the tradition. And you've got surprising choices within this. I mean, we've, we talked on an earlier show about how Luke wouldn't be the normal Pauline companion you would attach to a gospel if you just could pick someone who was a Pauline companion. Mark wouldn't be the person that you'd have write the gospel associated with Peter. After all, he failed in a Pauline mission and went home. Mm -hmm. He chickened out. And then Paul wouldn't even take him on the next mission. So if you were picking out of the blue, you wouldn't pick someone like that. So, so there, are the, there are these disconnects, as I say, these, what we call these embarrassments in the midst of the tradition that point to its authenticity. Give me a wrap-up statement, Dan. What I would say is the fact that these early church writers recognized that these documents were written by the apostles gave them, apostles and their associates, gave them an authority that could not be matched from the second century on. And ultimately, they recognized that those are the books that belonged in the canon. Terrific stuff. Now, we've got one more broadside that's come, and that is basically, didn't the scribes tamper with the text? And Bart Ehrman would say, in misquoting Jesus, that there are 400,000 manuscript variants, differences in the copies that have come down. There's only 136, what, thousand 100, verses? 138,000, 162 words. Okay, so you got three variants for every word in the New Testament. How do you know you got the original words the apostles used? That's our topic next week. Hear it from the authorities. I hope that you'll join me. Welcome to our program. Our question today is if we don't have the original manuscripts of the New Testament, okay, how do we know we have the original words of the apostles? That is a question that's bantered around in society today on television and novels and scholarly books, and uh, I bet you want to know the answer to that. Well, we've got the guys that can give you the answer. Guys, we're really glad that you're here. As we were coming in, we put up a picture of a best-selling book by Bart Ehrman that is called Misquoting Jesus. You actually went to school with Dan. You were buddies. You know about him. Well, I met him at Princeton his first year of a uh, doctoral program there. Tell me about him and tell me about the book, Misquoting Jesus. Uh, I've always found Bart to be a very congenial fellow, a nice guy, uh, fun to talk to, and uh, yet he's moved very far to the left since his days at Princeton. He started out at Moody, then he went to Wheaton, got his master's degree at Princeton, then his doctorate at Princeton. And uh, his book, Misquoting Jesus, is kind of the latest coming out of where he is on these issues that are very dear to his heart, which is the text of the New Testament. And the essential theme of Misquoting Jesus is we can't tell what the original text said, but what we can tell is it probably was not as fully orthodox as most of our manuscripts seem to suggest that it is. Yeah, I mean, people are concerned about the things that he said. They raised questions, and now in your classes, I mean, uh, you used to say that people used to sleep through textual criticism, and when you talk about the copies coming down and so on, they don't sleep any longer, and even lay people in the church are asking what kind of questions? Well, they're asking questions like, can we really know that we have the Bible, what was written originally, or something very close to it, our, our doctrines being played with because of these differences, that kind of thing. You know, Bart's story is not unusual. Um, the uh, introductory chapter to Craig Evans' book, Fabricating Jesus, which is a terrific book on Jesus. In the first chapter, he goes through the biographies of many people writing about Jesusanity and writing against Christianity. And almost every one of those stories belongs to someone who grew up in a 
home that was, a, that was Bible believing and was a very conservative Christianity. And what you see in, in, as he goes through these biographies is a kind of what I call brittle fundamentalism where there is a particular view of the way the scripture operates and if there's one violation of it, it isn't just that your view changes, it shatters. And so you go from one end of the spectrum and move very, very quickly to the other end of the spectrum and you feel so burned about the experience that you want to turn around and make sure no one goes through what you went through. I, I think that's a, an element of Bart's story. I think we see that in many people who write in this area. Um, who have ended up teaching in university settings. And so these questions are, in one, at one level, very legitimate questions that deserve answers. They deserve to be engaged and not simply said, well, that reflects liberalism or that's disrespectful, whatever. No, in some cases, these are very sincere questions that deserve careful attention. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's different questions that come up here. And let's start with the manuscript copies themselves. One of the criticisms that Bart has is that it seems to him, and uh, you tell me if he's, if he's giving an implication or if he really understands this, okay? And that is that, you know, we don't have the original copies, and we don't have copies of the original copies, and we don't have copies of those copies, and he makes it sound like we're so, down, so far down history before we get a copy, and then he hooks that up to the fact is that we have a certain amount of words in the text, and we've got three variations for every single word in the New Testament text. So he says, voila, how in the world can you say that we know this is what the apostles said? And then he draws some conclusions, namely, this affects the historical picture of Jesus, and it also affects Christian doctrine. So let's start, first of all, do we have manuscripts that go back very close to Jesus and the apostles? I think uh, what we need to say is Bart gives this image that we don't have manuscripts almost for hundreds of years at all. And at one place when he was on a TV or a radio show, he actually said that, but he, he knows that that's not the case. I'm not so sure he can say we don't have copies of copies of copies of copies. We don't know how many generations there are between the copies we do have and the original. But this we do know. We have in the second century between 10 and 15 manuscript copies. All of them are fragmentary. They're all papyri, but they're all from the New Testament. That's absolutely unheard of for any other Greco-Roman literature. You don't have any other ancient Greco-Roman literature that has copies that come within decades of the original documents, and yet people are saying, we can't possibly know what the original New Testament said. If that's true about the New Testament, it's a hundred times more true of all these other ancient yeah, documents. Yeah, one person said, if you're going to throw out the New Testament documents on that basis, you'd have to can all of, of history, period, ancient history. As far as the manuscript evidence is concerned, absolutely. Yeah. All right, tell me about this evidence and, and how full it is. Well, let me, let me address the question of this copies of copies, if okay. I may. Uh, the, the imagery that Bart is trying to present with this, I think, is an imagery that we all are familiar with. It's the telephone game that we all played as kids. And the whole point of the telephone game is you whisper something in somebody's ear, it goes down nine or ten people until you get to the last one, and he garbles the whole story, everybody laughs. The whole point of the game is to see if it can get garbled badly. So it's not necessarily a coherent message to begin with. And there's this sense of, we don't have copies of copies of copies of copies until we get to this point. There's the sense of this single line of transmission. The telephone game. Like the telephone game. But there's a lot of problems with using that analogy, whether Ehrman uses it explicitly or implicitly. First of all, we're dealing with written documents. We're not dealing with oral tradition in a parlor game. In other words, if you ask the guy, listen, instead of conveying that orally, just tell me, you're saying, write the message down and exactly. give it to me. Exactly, yeah. So if you've got a document, like the Gospel of John, written down, and the next guy is supposed to write it down, is he going to garble it as much as the guy who's hearing uh, these words? That's not, that's not likely. Uh, secondly, you have multiple lines of transmission. It's not just original person going through a single line. Now you've got three or four lines going out. Because the Gospel of John would be written, say, three, four, five, six times from one manuscript going out to different parts of the exactly. empire. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so you've got these lines of transmission from these original documents. Now if you compare just the last person in each one of those lines with their documents and compare them to each other, we'd have a far better sense of what that original document actually said. But thirdly, you do have not just the last person that we have to consult. We can consult several of the intermediate agents getting back much closer to the original. So if I say I'm going to pick number three guy in this line and number four guy in this line and number six guy in this line out of 300 guys, now we're getting very, very close to the original. We can make those comparisons. 
And finally, that original uh, document would have been copied far more than just one time. So again, it's not just one line of transmission, but it's several lines, maybe even 10 or 20 lines where this document is being copied, and then those develop their own streams of transmission. When you, when, when you see it in that light, it tells us that, oh, that is so different from the telephone game and so different from the impression that I'm getting from reading Misquoting Jesus that I think what we have here is something that tells us what the original text said. All right, I mean, you've actually gone around the world and you've photographed these copies from the different time periods. How much variation have you found and how much similarity have you found? I think Ehrman is, is uh, absolutely right when he says there are as many as 400,000 textual variants among our manuscripts. But what he doesn't communicate very clearly is that these differences are for the most part absolutely irrelevant. 75% of them are spelling differences or nonsense errors. There's one, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 2.7 where we have a famous textual problem there where Paul says that we became gentle among you or we became little children among you. And the difference between gentle and little children in Greek is one letter. It's either apioi or napioi. Well, there's one manuscript that has, we became hippoi, which is, we became horses among you. <laughs> well, that's what you call a nonsense reading. Nobody's going to think that's authentic. That still counts as a textual variant, even the, though the guy had too much caffeine that day and didn't know what he was doing, you know. But mm -hmm. the fact is, all of those variants, nonsense or not, count as textual variants. And 75% of them are going to be nonsense variants or just simple spelling differences. And, and the most common is what's called a movable new. It's the N at the end of a word, just like our indefinite article A or an, A book, an apple. And to put uh, the, the N on the end of an indefinite article, it doesn't change the meaning, it just changes how much the guy knows grammar. And I think we need to tell the folks why we're talking 400,000, why that's not a big deal to you. And that is that the number of manuscripts that you're starting to compare at the beginning is close to 30,000 mm -hmm. manuscripts. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I, I would argue that what we have for New Testament textual criticism is an embarrassment of riches. Any classical scholar would give his eye teeth and his left arm to own the kinds of manuscripts that we have to, to be able to sift out the original. When you look at just the Greek manuscripts alone, the numbers as of last week are 5,000 752 that we know of that are still uh, existing. 5,752. Compared that to the average classical Greco-Roman author, we're dealing with fewer than 20 copies. I think for Catullus, when I was in school, they had two. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just minimal material you're dealing yeah, with. Yeah, here's, here's the thing. Is, uh, is it's like in my class at school, there were the A students, B students, C students, and my friends, okay? <laughs> And let's say they gave the Gettysburg Address for us to copy. Okay, you had this one page, and we all copied it. Well, the A students, they were zipping right through this thing, and they got the punctuation and the spelling just about right, okay? And the B students weren't far behind. And the C students and the D students, they were very interesting. But if you took all of those together, instead of having just two, if you had a, an A student and a D student, you might be in trouble. But if you've got 50 kids, the more the better. In other words, mm -hmm. the, the more documents you have, the more you can compare, right. and not everybody's making an error in the same word, same mm -hmm. letter, same space. All right? If you start off with 5,000 plus Greek manuscripts, and you add then what? Well, with uh, the Latin manuscripts, we have over 10,000 copies of those, almost twice as many Latin manuscripts as we do of Greek. Then you've got Coptic and Syriac, and we don't know how many Coptic and Syriac we have, but it is probably in the thousands for those. We've got Georgian, we've got Armenian, we've got Old Church Slavonic, we've got languages that nobody knows, never heard of, except for two guys who know this today, and that's it. But all together, I think what we're dealing with between the versional witnesses and the Greek manuscripts is somewhere between 20 and 30,000 manuscripts altogether. All right. Now, the other thing is you've got, correct me if I'm wrong, you've got a million quotations from the church fathers. Over a million of the New Testament. Yes. Okay, so let's put these numbers together. You got a million there, and you've got 138,000 words 30,000 times. Mm -hmm. Okay? Not, not really, because not all these manuscripts have the whole New Testament. Most of them are selections. But it gives the folks an idea what we're talking about, because uh, we're just giving numbers here. But you've got a ton of words. Mm -hmm. I don't know if 
what n that number is, but it's big. Okay. And most of them, most of them are, as we said, are typos. They're like, if you ever get an email from me and you get one that doesn't have a typo in it, it means I didn't type it. Well, but these, the, would, <laughs> these wouldn't be called typos. These would be called handos. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, in, in all of that stuff, if there is one difference in a letter, that's a manuscript variant. That counts that's right. as a variant. Every letter difference counts as a variant. So 400,000 out of that total number, which is probably, what, 3 billion plus or so on, I mean, that's minuscule to start with. And then out of that, you're saying 75% becomes spelling and right. nonsense stuff. Something that stuff. a reader, when he see it, would immediately be able to recognize what's going on for most cases and know how to fix it. Exactly. Just like mm. we do this kind of thing every day when we read the newspaper, and, and we uh, see uh, what the box scores are for the sports and say, oh, they flip this, the scores between these two teams. You know, th this is a natural tendency for us to be able to make these corrections on the fly as we read material. Well, that, that largest category is, is just spelling and nonsense errors, but the second largest category still is not significant. It has to do with transpositions or the use of synonyms. Like In other words, in, word order. Yeah. <coughs> uh, it, when, I, when you think of synonyms, you think of like John chapter 4, verse 1, where it says the Lord, or it says Jesus. Big debate among textual critics, which one is the original there? But it doesn't say the Lord or Peter. It's the Lord or Jesus. Both times it refers to the same person, and yet that's an important enough textual variant to be listed in the apparatus. All right, hold on. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about you got 100% to get to this 400,000 manuscript variants that uh, Bart Ehrman is talking about, and we already got 75% lopped off, and now we're talking about the rest of the pie, and I want to get down to the stuff that's really important here. We're going to do that when we come right back. Stick with us. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dr. Darrell Bach and Dr. Daniel B. Wallace about the manuscripts of the New Testament. Do we have for sure the words that the apostles actually wrote in the Scripture? The Jesus Seminar says this, even careful copyists make mistakes, as every proofreader knows. So we will never be able to claim certain knowledge of exactly what the original text of any biblical writing was. Now, Dan, they're saying you got these 400,000 manuscript variances, differences in all of these texts. You got 30,000 texts, 136, 30, 38,000 words in every text uh, or close to that. You add all that up, you add a million quotations from the church fathers, and you only got 400,000 differences. And you started us off by, let's go through the list again. Out of the pie of 100% representing 400,000 manuscript variants, you're starting off with 75% or what? 75% are spelling errors or spelling differences or nonsense. Then the next two chunks would be almost 25%, and that's going to be word order changes because in Greek you can change the word order without changing what the subject is. If you say Jesus loves John, you can actually have the word order John loves Jesus, but anybody who knows Greek knows that Jesus is the subject, John is the object because of the endings on those words. You're also saying that there is Every time there is a difference in word order, even though the meaning doesn't change, like in Jesus Loves John, how many ways could Jesus Loves John be written in Greek, and each one of them is a difference? There's at least 18 ways to write Jesus Loves John without any spelling variations between those two at all. If you have spelling variations, you've just doubled it to 36 in terms of uh, one of the names. Then you've got some other little particles and then some differences in terms of how you have the word love. My estimate is you've got somewhere between 500 and 1,000 ways to say Jesus loves John in Greek without essentially changing the meaning at all. That's the potential number of variants we have on that three word And then you've got 30,000 manuscripts. Yeah. It's okay. A, the other thing is that, it, it, you, I'll, I'll go back and maybe you've already said this, but the fact is they used to have the definite article in front of names. So it would be the John, the Mary, the Philip. Okay, when you translate that over, the fact doesn't make any difference at all. Right. We all know we're talking about John, Mary, Philip. Right. Right? Yeah. All right, what else? Well, then the next largest category is those textual variants that are meaningful, but they are not viable. And by viable, I mean they cannot go back to the original text because they're found in one 14th century manuscript or a 12th century manuscript that has no history that suggests it goes back to the original. And those, that, that's a, a fairly large group. The smallest group of textual variants we have by far it's less than 1% are those variants that are both meaningful 
and viable. And that means we're dealing with much less than 1% of all these 400,000 texture variants are going to impact anything. And the question is, what do they impact? Right. So you're saying, you're saying that 99% of that text, it's like Snow White. We got 99.4% <laughs> pure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, and if you just stopped right there, that's fantastic. Okay, but we can go even further. But let, let me give the, the audience an illustration. Listen to what I say. If I say John 3.16 is this, For God so loved the world that He gave the only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And let's say you've got 29,000 manuscripts that come down with that wording. Okay, and you've got uh, the rest up to 30,000, okay, that say, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, you've got 29,000 that leave the word for in there, and you've got all the rest that don't have it, okay? Now, as a textual critic, you, you simply say, take a wild guess here. <laughs> okay, if you've got 29,000 that have it in there, it probably ought to be in there. But even if it wasn't, it doesn't change the meaning of John 3.16. Right, it, it changes an explicit connection with the preceding verse, but that's all it does. And, and those are plenty of the variants we have, is the little conjunctions. Those are meaningful and viable variants. Did he say for, did he say and, you know, those kinds of things. All right, now, give me the conclusion of what do you hear him saying? Well, what I hear him saying is, is that when it's all said and done, and by the way, he's not the only one saying it. Virtually every text critic uh, in the last few centuries has been saying this. When it's all said and done, no doctrine, central doctrine of the Christian faith is impacted by, the, by this remainder. That uh, we might discuss whether a particular verse has a particular teaching, that's impacted by these differences. But whether the sum total of what Christianity teaches is not touched by this pool of variants. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to the, to the criticism. These manuscript variants are supposed to change our historical view of Jesus or they're supposed to touch Christian doctrine in some way. Do they? Well, I think this is the impression Ehrman tries to give, but he doesn't produce the evidence that shows that. And so people read his book and they have this chicken little mentality that says, my gosh, the sky is falling. I don't know what to believe anymore. But you, you start looking at the evidence, you say the deity of Christ is untouched by these viable variants. The virgin birth is untouched. The resurrection of Christ is untouched. Everything that the Bible teaches that's a cardinal truth, an essential truth, is found there in the manuscripts and is untouched by the variants. All right. We're going to save this over till the next program because we've got to get to the next big thing that he says. And a lot of Christians, they have questions about this too. They shouldn't, but they do. Ehrman says that the woman taken in adultery, that story doesn't even belong in the Bible. He also says the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark shouldn't be in the Bible. He says 1 John 5, 7, which explicitly defines the Trinity, is not part of the Bible. And he says, the stuff that we have about Jesus in Hebrews, about crying out and his dying on the cross, as well as uh, what is said in the Gospels about him healing the lepers. Did he do it in terms of he cared or he was angry? All right. Ehrman says, these are examples, which we're going to get to next week. These are the examples that there's been a big screw up and there's been a big change in some sense. He says, the scribes intentionally did this. So you can't trust that Bible of yours. That's wrong, but we're going to tell you why it's wrong in our next program. I hope that you'll join us. Welcome to our program today. Coming into the program, you saw the fact that we had Bart Ehrman's book up, Misquoting Jesus. In that book, he's saying if we don't have the original uh, copies, the original manuscripts of the apostles, and we don't have copies, copies, copies down the line, and then we've got 400,000 textual variants, how in the world can you say you know what the apostles actually wrote about Jesus? Didn't this affect the view of the historical Jesus, and didn't it affect the doctrine in a big time way? And to unscramble this for us today, uh, Dr. Daryl Bach is one of the leading uh, scholars on the historical Jesus in the world today, and next to him is one of the leading textual critics in the world, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace. He is also director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, actually photographs digitally manuscript copies around the world, has even un uncovered more copies that go into the, the pile of New Testament documents that have been discovered. He's the senior New Testament editor of the Net Bible. 
He has also written Greek grammar beyond the basics and exegetical syntax of the New Testament. Dan, I've got a quote from you from Bart Ehrman, and he says this. This textual critic, Bart Ehrman, says, The more I studied the manuscript tradition of the New Testament, the more I realized just how radically the text has been altered over the years. All right? You don't believe that is the case. Tell me why. Well, I'll use what Ehrman has said in another book that he wrote with Dr. Bruce Metzger, his mentor, the text of the New Testament that was just published in 2005, the fourth edition. And both of them said that the Alexandrian text stream, or these manuscripts that are our earliest and most important manuscripts, are a very pure stream of transmission. And when we look at those, which is what most textual critics rely on largely to get back to the original text, they're, they're very, very close to each other. When Ehrman is talking about wild manuscripts or a disparate text, he's talking about manuscripts over here, but not about the ones that textual critics would regard for the most part as going back to the original. Take us back to a few things you said last week. Let's start off with the wealth of documents that we have for these New Testament writings compared to anything else in ancient history. Well, we've got far more material for the New Testament than we do for any other Greco-Roman materials, uh, writings. We, if you took the average classical author and stacked up how many books he has written. Homer, Aristotle, Catullus, Herodotus. Right, well, those, I would not call those guys okay. the average ones, but if you talk, okay. Homer's way up there as far, he's the number two after the New Testament. But uh, you take some of these average guys and they have fewer than 20 copies of their manuscripts still in existence. That, you stack them up, it would be about four feet tall. And also the time, from the time they wrote it to the time that you guys discovered a copy, a lot of them, it's what? It's usually between 500 and 1,000 years before we get any copies of them at all. All right. We're talking about by the time you get to 400 years after the New Testament is completed, we've got 60, 70 copies. I mean, it's, by the time we get that far out, we've already got uh, uh, dozens of copies. And 50 to 100 years from the time that the apostles wrote, how many copies did we you have? We have between 10 and 15 fragments of the New Testament. Still in existence in your hands today? Still in existence, yes. All right. So you've got a wealth of of Well, let me compare copies. it if I can. This, yeah. the, you know, you, you have the, these classical writers, uh, their materials stands four feet tall. Then you stack up the New Testament documents. We're talking about the Greek manuscripts and the versions. I don't even know how to classify the, the, the over mil, one million quotations by the Church Fathers. That stack is going to go over a mile high. So no wonder we talk about an embarrassment of riches for New Testament studies. So this mile high stack is what your textual criticism is all about. This is your science over here of comparing right. all of these texts and going word for word and seeing, you know, you've got 29,000 manuscripts that have this word right there and then you go to the next one and the next one and, and all right. now. Of these manuscript variants, Ehrman says, you know, there are 400,000 manuscript variants, which you agree with. I agree with that number. Yeah. Okay. So, it's, a, it's our best guess. But then he says there's 138,000 verses in the New Testament, so that's like three different options for every word in the New Testament. Well, 138,000 words in the New Testament, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, if you, if you, let's divide that again like we did last week. If you have 100% of the pie is 400,000 manuscripts. We want to say, how in the world do we get that? And does that really damage our looking back at Jesus or Christian doctrine? Let's talk about what those variants are when you count right. them. When you think about the, the numbers that Ehrman keeps spewing out about between 300 and 400,000, at one point he says maybe as high as half a million, we just don't know. He's constantly putting the emphasis on the quantity. But when you think about the quality of those variants, now it paints an entirely different story. My students at Dallas Seminary right now are taking this class on textual criticism, and they are what's called collating ancient manuscripts. They have to go through and transcribe every single letter. And for the most part, they're very bored with the job because the, the biggest changes they get are spelling differences. If they see an actual variant that has meaning, it's very, very rare. It's a, it's, it's a long time in coming. So they're bored with seeing how much uh, minimal variation we have. And you're saying, as a textual critics, critic, uh, when you look at this mile and high st uh, stack of documents, that you're saying that 75% of all these variants is simply spelling errors or, or nonsense differences. 75%, you throw it away. It doesn't even matter. Doesn't even matter. Every time you see the name John, it's spelled with one N or two Ns. It depends on the, on the manuscript, and that's a, a variant. And then the next largest category is the meaningful variants that are not viable and those that are 
uh, word order changes, synonyms, that's uh, almost Yeah, 20, go back on this thing as Jesus loves John. How many ways right. can you say that? You can say it 18 different ways. In and Greek. you could write it 18 different, different ways. 18 different ways, yeah. And each time it shows up in a different way, although the meaning doesn't change. The meaning is exactly That's the same. a variant. That counts as a variant. And you yeah. also got a million quotations from the church fathers that enter into, if they quoted right. that verse a little differently, even though it's got the same meaning, the fact is that's a variant. Right. You got a potential for a big variant count here. You have a potential for in the millions, in the tens of millions of variants for the New Testament. The fact that we only have three to four hundred thousand is minuscule compared Astounding. to what it could be. Yeah. All it's right. amazing how, how right. stable the text has been over right. the Keep going on this pie here. You got seventy five percent and then you've got almost twenty five percent that are the ones that are these word order changes or synonyms and the meaningful variants that are not viable. That is they don't go back to the original. That leaves us with one category left, and this is the one that Ehrman is really talking about, the meaningful and viable variants. That is, those that affect the meaning of the text and could possibly go back to the original. And these are less than 1%? Less than 1%. Smallest category we have by far. Okay. Do any of these affect Christian doctrine or the history of Jesus? Well, this is the remarkable thing, is Ehrman makes it sound as if they do, but there is no essential doctrine that is impacted by any viable variant. What I find interesting is that the people don't know is that going back as far as 1707, the textual critics already came down to the rule of? Well, in 1707 you had a fellow by the name of John Mill who had put together a Greek New Testament because the, uh, the, uh, there were critics who were saying, your Greek New Testament has a lot of variants and we don't know what the original text is. So he spent a lot of time putting this together. A week before he died, he gets this thing published and it has 30,000 textual problems listed. In 1707, he had found that many, one man all by himself. Then you had Johann Albrecht Bengel who comes along and he looks at Mill's work and he uh, comes up with a statement of the orthodoxy of the variants. Bengel also lived in the 1700s and he said there is no doctrine that's impacted by any of these variants. And from that point on, from Bengel's statement on, that has been pretty much the standard view of the textual variants except for a few people that are really on the outside of this discipline in terms of what they're, what they're that's claiming. That's more than 200 years ago. Yeah. You guys have known this all along. Right. Yeah, the only thing that's impacted is, is whether or not a particular verse has a particular kind of teaching. Now that's happening uh, in any one of these variants where, there, where there's viability. There is something about the passage that's usually at stake that makes it a meaningful variant. But that's different than saying when you put the whole package together, um, we've lost something central about Christian teaching. Because if it isn't in this passage, we can find it in this passage right. over here where there's not a textual problem or a textual variant. Let, let me give an illustration of that if I can. In 1 Timothy 3.16, in most modern translations, it says something about Jesus to the effect of who was manifested in the flesh. Now, the King James Bible says God was manifested or revealed in the flesh. And the difference between who and God in Greek is simply one bar in the middle of a letter. Who would be spelled, it looks like an O-C, and then God looks like an O-C with a line through the, the O, which is the letter theta, and it has a bar above it. So the difference between those two is one little bar. It's a real minimal difference, but you can see how scribes could mistake one for the other. And at the same time, you say, well, gee, if Paul originally wrote that God was manifest in the flesh, and this has been changed to who, do we lose the deity of Christ? Of course not. The deity of Christ does not depend on one verse. I think who was manifest in the flesh is the original. I know Darrell believes that as well. But the fact is that the deity of Christ, as we said in an earlier program, is, is just found throughout the New Testament. It does not depend on this passage. It's not the doctrine that we're talking about. We're talking about how many verses we have that affirm that doctrine. And if you have 28 verses instead of 27 verses, that's not a big difference. All right, we've saved the big blast for last, okay? And uh, part of Bart Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus, which is a popular bestseller today, is that there are certain parts of the New Testament that our Christians are carrying around that do not belong to the text at all. And let me name some of them. We'll take a break and we'll come back and we'll nail these down. The woman taken in adultery, that story has no part of the text, shouldn't be in there. The last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark, cut those out, those shouldn't be in there. 1 John 5, 7 that talks about the Trinity, that shouldn't be in there. Uh, Jesus was angry when he healed the lepers. That's a big change. It's supposed to impact the whole book of Mark, okay? Uh, Jesus crying out in terror on the cross, Hebrews 2.9 attached to Hebrews 5.7. Uh, All right, he's saying 
you got these examples out there, you cannot trust your Bible. All right? Let's get the answer to that. When we come back, we'll take a break right now. Stick with us. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Daryl Bach and Dr. Danny B. Wallace, and we're talking about one of the key questions that is bantered around in our society today, and that is, can we trust the words that we find in the New Testament? Can we trust the books and the doctrine and the historical Jesus that we find there, or has it been intentionally changed by the scribes coming down, or do we have so many variants in the text that we can't tell what, what word was supposed to be in there? And Examples that Bart Ehrman has used, a textual critic, a critic that has got a best-selling book, Misquoting Jesus, is he uses the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark. This is kind of a shock tactic that he's saying, look, do you realize that you ought to knock off the last 12 verses in the Gospel of Mark? And like, that's supposed to affect a whole lot of things. Tell us why you're not impressed. Uh, this has been known by, for at least 125 years that those last 12 verses are probably not authentic. And there's no doctrinal statement for any evangelical school or church that I know of that says these 12 verses, Mark 16, 9 through 20, must be in our Bible. It's an important story, but the fact is whether that's part of Scripture or not does not impact any fundamental doctrine. That Actually, in every Bible that you've got out there, probably except what King James is, you've got a footnote that says it's not part of the original text. Yeah, the, most, most of our modern translations, except for King James and New King James, are going to have a, a, a marginal note that'll say, not found in the oldest authorities, which is true. The Net Bible actually gets into some details of this. Do you back that up? The fact is if we got rid of it, you're not missing anything? Absolutely. I think if you look at it carefully, you'll see that it's kind of a composite of the other endings. Mm -hmm. And with very, there's almost nothing that is new that doesn't come from somewhere else. And, and so I think uh, what it shows is uh, someone read the ending of Mark as it uh, likely existed with this kind of open-ended ending where it's challenging the reader about what are you going to do with the resurrection. And they go, ooh, that's <laughs> a little too difficult. So, so they fill it in with some appearances, et cetera, and a form of the Great Commission so that, so that the ending of Mark looks like the other Gospels. Quickly, what, what do you say to those guys that say, well, you know, uh, Mark didn't know about the resurrection? <laughs> uh, he couldn't write about the Son of God if he didn't know about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And if it's he didn't also know about after the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if he doesn't know about the resurrection, that's the that's the craziest idea uh, in the world. He fits into the church tradition that he's a part of. He's writing the gospel as part of. He's talking about the Son of God, which assumes the exaltation. He's got to have a resurrection. He's and also got an empty tomb, and he's yeah. got yeah, exactly. Jesus prophesying his own resurrection three times in that gospel. And so obviously, it's an open-ended uh, ending here that it's inviting the reader to say, "What are you going to do with Jesus?" Also, if you got Paul writing before Mark, you've got 1 Corinthians 15 on the table. He already knows about that and the resurrection it's appearances. Precisely the point: you cannot talk about a Son of God without a, a, a Son of God who is still alive and impacting people if you don't have a resurrection. Well, you also do have the resurrection, Mark 16, 1 through right. 8. Yeah. You just don't have any resurrection appearances by Jesus to humans. That's the distinction. So to say that there is no resurrection of Jesus in Mark 16, it's if wrong. it stops at verse 8, is not correct. All right, another one that people might be surprised at is that the story of the woman taken in adultery that's brought mm -hmm. before Jesus, okay? He says that is not part of the text. What do you say to that? I uh, agree with him that it's not part of what John wrote. It's John 7:53 through 8:11. And here's one of the, the questions I like to ask people. I say, this is my favorite passage that's not in the Bible. And the point is, if you had to make a choice between Mark 16, 9 through 20, and John 7, 53 through 8, 11, you could put just one of those passages in the Bible and you have to take the other one out. So far, every place I've gone and I've asked that question, universally people have said, Mark 16 is gone, I'm keeping this story. And so it's a passage that the ancient scribes wanted as well. It has less uh, testimony for it than Mark 16 does, the longer passage. So on the basis of text critical principles, we have to agree with Ehrman. This passage is out. All right, one more. No problem if we have 1 John 5, 7, which explicitly defines the Trinity. Give us the verse, and then should it be in or should it be out? Uh, 1 John 5, 7 that's found in the King James Bible says that there are three witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. This is a verse that was added to the Bible in 1522 when Erasmus, who was the first uh, publisher of any Greek New Testament, got pressure from the church to add this Trinitarian statement because it had been found in some Latin manuscripts. 
And so there was some scribe by the name of Roy working in 1520 at Oxford, and he writes out this whole Greek New Testament and somehow gets into Erasmus's hands. And Erasmus never made the promise that he'd put it in if, if he found such a manuscript, but he basically said the reverse. I didn't put it in because I didn't find any manuscript. So he finds this manuscript. I'm sure somebody brought it to his door. And he writes in that Greek text, and he actually changes the text from what Roy had written, because Roy didn't know very, Greek very well. He wrote, translated the Latin into Greek, you know, and Erasmus had to make the fixes. But it's not found in our ancient manuscripts. It's found in four 16th century manuscripts, and four manuscripts in the 12th century or later in the marginal note with a 16th or 17th century hand. That's a passage that I'd have to say, this is not authentic. And the ancient church never even thought about it being authentic. Ehrman talks about this passage as if there's no way we could have ever come up with the doctrine of the Trinity without this, and therefore the Trinity is not true. But he knows what the church councils believed. He knows about the Council of Constantinople in 381 and the Council of, of uh, 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 Nicaea and all the rest of these, uh, uh, the, the Chalcedonian Creed in 451 that clearly affirmed the Trinity without having this verse even in existence. And if it had been in existence, they would have put that at the top of the oh, stack. Oh, you bet they would. Yeah. Okay. So they were able to determine the Trinity. So for 1,500 years, you stack up all the documents and the copies that you had, and there's not one copy that's got that verse in it. Not one Greek copy. Right. Okay. We have it in a few late Latin Vulgate manuscripts. Yeah. I mean, that's astounding. Yeah. All right. In terms of the reliability of the text, uh, Talk about Bruce Metzger, who was the mentor to Bart Ehrman, and what he said after a lifetime of study in terms of the text. Metzger was a, he's the kind of a scholar that most biblical scholars would say, well, look, we all put our pants on the same way, except for Bruce Metzger. I don't know how he does it, jumps into it from a parachute or something, but <laughs> he was just, he was in a league by himself. And uh, Metzger, at the end of his life, towards the end of his life, he, he says, you know, the more I've studied this text, the more I have come to believe that what it tells me about Jesus is true. And he had even greater certainty about the historical reliability of these manuscripts than he did when he began his study. What should students do with Bart Ehrman's book? I, I encourage them to read it. He's asking the right questions, but I encourage them not to read just his book. I think they should read our book as well, Dethroning Jesus, and uh, read uh, Putting Jesus in His Place that shows how strongly the deity of Christ is mentioned. This is by Komaszewski and Bowman. Uh, they should read Lee Strobel's book, The Case for the Real Jesus. They should ask these questions, but they should not start with, as uh, uh, Darrell called it, um, a brittle fundamentalism, or with a hardening of the categories. What they need to do is have, let me wrestle with these issues and realize that the person of Christ is more important than what I think about the Bible. And if they understand that, then they, they come to the place where they revere Him, and it's because of His attitude about the Bible they can have, I think, the right attitude about Scripture as well. Take us through that, Darrell. The fact is you start with the historical Jesus just like you would look at any other historical figure. Do we have information about Abraham Lincoln? Was he a president of the United States at one time? You know, did he die in Ford's Theater? Did he slip on a banana peel and die in Peoria? The fact is that's <laughs> historical information that you can look, and we don't have to think that those documents yeah, I'm not are taking inspired. the Peoria option. <laughs> All, right. All right, and there's reasons why. And going yeah. back in history, you come to a time of, of Julius Caesar, and you've got a person right next to him, Jesus Christ, and you've got all this information. So a student that's looking at this, should he start with the inerrancy and inspiration idea that comes later on, or what do you start with? Well, I start with looking at Jesus and even take the view that if the New Testament has the gist of the story of Jesus right, which is likely, these people lived and walked with Jesus, uh, they knew who he was, they knew what he taught. If they've got the gist of the story right, then I know that not only is Jesus' teaching important to them, but Jesus' person is important to the plan of God. And in that context, then, they will embrace him and his message and take it seriously about what it has to say about the human condition. The human condition is really the object of Jesus' work along with the, crea the, the condition of creation. And if they'll take a serious look at that, they will ask, would we invent a religion that says that we all have a need that we ourselves cannot meet? It's not culturally correct. It is cosmically correct. And in that sense, then, the invitation is to enter into a relationship with God that we have broken and that He has taken the initiative to fix. It's a wonderful invitation. And uh, I think when you come to Jesus and embrace that and then you see the respect with which he handles the Bible, that 
uh, changes the way you think about the Bible as well. And also from all you've told me, it's historically correct. Absolutely. I think I can, I can make, now it's not a case of certainty, but I can make a very plausible case, historically speaking, that what the Christian faith says about Jesus Christ and Christianity is in fact historically rooted and grounded. All right. Next week, we're going to take conversation stoppers. All right, you've introduced this term and, and uh, these terms, and the fact is it comes from uh, the books that have been written, the TV specials that have been done, that certain questions about Jesus, Jesus have been introduced into our culture, and everybody seems to know the questions. So if you talk about Jesus, these conversation stoppers come out. What about all those other Gospels that never made it in? Uh, didn't you know that history is written by the winners? Didn't Jesus marry Mary Magdalene and have a kid going into France? I mean, all of these questions, and we're going to answer those questions next week. You won't miss that program. I hope that you'll join us. Welcome to our program. We're going to talk about conversation stoppers that have been introduced into our society by books, TV specials, and uh, other ways, scholarly books and so on, so that when you talk about Jesus, all of a sudden somebody says, well, what about this? And we're going to talk about those questions that are listed in our society today that are out there all over the place. And uh, we've got two of the world's best scholars right here. Dr. Daryl Bach has been on almost every historical Jesus special that you've got on the networks, and uh, he is professor of New Testament research at Dallas Theological Seminary and the author of, of just a ton of books, just, just great. And they've written a new book, Dethroning Jesus, and his cohort in that was uh, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace, who is uh, one of the leading authorities on textual criticism in the Greek manuscript copies of the New Testament. He's also the director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, the senior New Testament editor of the Net Bible, and has written the Greek grammar beyond the basics and exegetical syntax of the New Testament. Daryl, tell me a little bit more about these conversation stoppers, because you actually coined the phrase. Conversation stopper is something that, uh, that stops a conversation when you go to talk about Jesus. You start to talk about him, and someone has heard something on a television special, they've read it in a book, that is kind of, a, it isn't about the Bible per se, it's about what's going on around the Bible or something that's a supposition to how the Bible's put together. And so they raise this question, and if you don't have any background to answer the question, the conversation stops. You'll never get to Jesus. You'll never talk about what you had hoped to talk about because this stops the conversation. Our hope has been that in this series of programs that you have gotten the answer to these questions. So it's kind of a review, if you will, because all quiz. professors love to review. Uh, quiz. All, all right. right, that's right. Take out a piece of paper and number to 10. Here they come. All right. We've got 10 questions for you <laughs> that are conversation stoppers. Yep. All right, number one. I mean, this goes back to the Da Vinci Code. If they go into Barnes & Noble or any uh, secular bookstore, they will find a ton of books over on one side that have something like uh, the Gnostic Bible, uh, the Lost Gospels of Christianity, you've got the Book of Thomas, you've got the Gospel of, of Peter and Mary, and people look at all of this, and it revolves around the question that Dan Brown put into his Da Vinci Code, what about all those other Gospels that never made it into the Bible? And he went and said, well, you know, there were 80 other Gospels and only four were chosen. Start me off. Well, and the way this is usually formulated is, is that at least the way Dan Brown said it is, is that Constantine was responsible for that choice. Constantine did not have schmatz to do with the canon. A technical okay? word. That is a technical word. It means nothing. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. <laughs> okay, he didn't have anything to do with this process. Um, the books that didn't make it into the New Testament uh, didn't make it into the New Testament because either their theology was different than the regular fay that we've been talking about on the shows, this core orthodoxy that's moving through even before we get to the recognition of the canon and that we can see in doctrinal summaries and in hymns and in the sacraments. Uh, or, or they uh, are too late. It's, in some cases, it's actually both. In fact, in most mm -hmm. cases, it's actually both. Uh, and, and so they never, they never had a chance to get in because they did not reflect 
the faith, not of the fathers, but of the faith of the apostles in Jesus. And, and so they never, they never made it in. There weren't 80 of them, okay? Uh, I think Dan mentioned uh, a number of about 45 earlier. It's, it's in the high 30s, low 40s is the number of what we actually have in our hands. So it's almost half what uh, Dan Brown uh, suggested. Uh, and, and there wasn't any dispute about most of these works. The, the one work that comes the closest is a gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is a hybrid gospel. It, it probably has some content that may go back to the earliest traditions tied to Jesus. If you read the Gospel of Thomas, 25% of it you read and you go, boy, that looks familiar. Well, the reason it looks familiar is it's saying something very much like Matthew, Mark, mm -hmm. Luke, or John. You read another 25% and you go, that sounds sort of familiar. And it sounds sort of familiar because it's sort of like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then there is the 50%. I've never heard or seen that before. And that's because you've never heard or seen that before. <laughs> that's new stuff. It's coming from somewhere else. And so the Gospel of Thomas is a hybrid gospel. It's an early second century gospel. And because it has some overlap with the synoptic gospels, it's gained a lot of attention. But Origen told us in the early third century that the Gospel of Thomas is not read in the churches, which is a way of telling us it was not viewed as Scripture. Let, let me add, too, that Dan Brown argues that these Gospels emphasize the humanity of Jesus, not His deity, which is exactly the opposite of what we see. The vast majority of these extra-canonical Gospels are putting an emphasis on His divinity or His uh, other-than-human aspects. They did not view Him as fully human. You've got one that says, I saw Jesus and his footprints never left, or his feet never left any prints in the sand. That kind of a statement. This is some, someone who's uh, superhuman. He's not really quite human the, at all. In, in fact, there's only one Christian group that does not uh, affirm the deity of Jesus that I'm aware of. It's the group that was known as the Ebionites. They were so Jewish they couldn't admit to the deity of Jesus because they thought only God the Father could be God. That's the only group out of all this material. So Dan Brown's reason is dead wrong. And, mm -hmm. and uh, at what we have had with Jesus from the very beginning is a high view of Jesus, which is interesting in light of what Jesus Sanity wants to make of Jesus, which is they want him to not be divine. That doesn't fit in with the ancient evidence. What's the difference between Jesus Sanity and Christianity? Jesus Sanity is the idea that Jesus is teaching matters, that he's a prophet, that he can be respected for that reason, but his person does not matter to the program of God or to the nature of the Christian faith. Christianity is that Jesus is the anointed one and this person is at the at the center, at the hub of what God is doing and that his person is very much relevant to what Christianity is. Orthodox Christianity has always been Christianity. I know this one, next one is, uh, is one of your favorites. And it's, unfortunately, it is still on the table today. We probably will see specials up ahead that have this thing, this theme. Question is, don't you know that history is written by the winners? And now that we can hear the losers, Gnostic Gospels, we need to revise the Bible's story. And this is an interesting one because generally speaking it is true that the history that survives is the history that comes from the people who win. Uh, and it is true that we've gotten our hands on a lot of material now that we didn't have before and that does fill out the picture of our understanding of history. All that is true. But here's what is false in the implication. That revision, what we have learned from what we have dug up, does not require that the traditional understanding of Christianity as being rooted in the apostles and being rooted in Jesus needs a significant change. Nor does it change the fact that this Gnostic Christianity or this Christian Gnosticism is really a, um, a deviation from historical Christianity that grew out of Judaism. Those two cardinal facts are not altered by what we have found. And the interesting thing, too, is that Christianity is actually a work that's written by the losers, okay? If you looked at the time when Christianity was, was, going, was flourishing and beginning to grow and where it sprouted, I'd say the Romans were doing pretty well. <laughs> yep. All right, let's take this next one. And uh, there's just a fascination with this question. Didn't Jesus marry, uh, marry Magdalene and have a daughter in France? Do I take that one? Oh, I'll let Daryl take that All one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy, we'll let him answer that one. <laughs> it's so silly. This is, this is one I like to have fun with. Because uh, when, when this question was initially raised, well, it was initially raised in a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail, a long time ago, but it was re-raised by the Dan Brown special. And it's been resurrected in a varied form uh, in some of the stuff that happened with the Jesus tomb. 
But uh, this was one that BeliefNet.com asked uh, myself and John Dominic Crossan to tackle because I was a conservative and he was a non-conservative and they had a thing on their, on their website called SmackDown, which is kind of like Worldwide uh, Wrestling Federation except on theology. I know it's a horrible image. Don't think about who's in the white trunks and who's in the black trunks. <laughs> but anyway, so they had us do this SmackDown and the expectation was the conservative would take one position and the liberal would take another position. Well, in fact, what happened is, is that I argued that, Je that Jesus was never married and that there's no historical evidence for it. And John Dominic Crossan, who's a liberal, argued that Jesus was never married and they never had evidence. There was no smackdown, okay? It was a love fest. <laughs> and, and I tell my students that when you can get liberal and conservative historical Jesus scholars to agree about something, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, it's probably true. The fact is there is no good, solid, evidence anywhere that Jesus was married to anybody, much less Mary. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the rest of these questions. We're going to start off with, then they find the bones of Jesus in a suburb of Jerusalem with other members of his family. Uh, you were part of the Ted Koppel team that uh, analyzed that special. You were on the network television program. And so we're going to get your take on that when we come right back. All right, we're back. We're talking about conversation stoppers that we find in our society. Uh, questions about Jesus that stop a conversation cold, and you need to know these answers. And so let's take another one that uh, is in our society, and it came off of a, a television special not too long ago. And here's the question. Didn't they find the bones of Jesus in a suburb of Jerusalem in Talpiot? And he had other members of his family in that tomb. And uh, that goes right along with the next question. Well, you know, Jesus' resurrection was only a spiritual resurrection. It wasn't a physical, so it really doesn't matter. Let, let, me, let me take this to start with. If I okay. Can. All right. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, this is probably where I'd have a, a disagreement with Daryl. I, I think they did find Jesus' bones in the Tapia tomb. And the reason we know that, that it was Jesus is because on the left wrist there was a little wristband, and it said, what would I do? I <laughs> 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 do Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> your turn. Yeah. yeah, your turn. Yeah. What else can I say? No, seriously, the, 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 the gist of the response to the Talpiot tomb claim is that these names were too common to make anything out of it. That, first of all, the location of the tomb for being a family tomb of Jesus is in the wrong place. He lived in Galilee. Uh, he would have had a family tomb up there. So the ability to procure this tomb and do the reburial within the space of a year, keep it completely secret, et cetera, is very, very unlikely. So between the social factors that were involved in it, as well as the common nature of the names, uh, it didn't take more than a week to two weeks before almost everyone, and, I'm, and again, this is a conservative Christians, not so conservative Christians, secular Jews, conservative Jews, atheists, uh, I mean, this, 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 was, this there was, was almost universal agreement in the scholarly world that there was nothing to this. You spent time with Amos Cloner right in Jerusalem, right after the special with Ted Koppel. What did he say? Yeah, Amos Cloner was the guy who was in charge of the original excavation of this site, and he basically said that that special had a mistake about every five minutes. <laughs> Tell, you met with Tal Alon, too, and tell who Tal Alon Should, is. Tal Alon is the expert on, on names in this period and the frequency of names in this period. And she basically said when they interviewed her, she felt like a hostile witness uh, on behalf of defending a murderer because they tried to back her into a corner and finally they asked a question so hypothetical she had to answer it the way they wanted to, to answer it honestly, but she realized what it was that they were up to. You warned the people that uh, did the special, you warned them of the reaction and that they really didn't know what they were getting into. And uh, then you were part of the Ted Koppel special and especially one of the things you said was you say that it's only a spiritual resurrection or not a physical resurrection. This has vast implications. You don't really know the territory you're getting into. Tell us why. Yeah, this was advice that uh, the, the filmmaker uh, who was Jewish had received from his Christian consultant, a man named Jim Tabor, who does archaeological work and teaches at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. And, uh, and I said, the idea that there would be a resurrection without a physical body in Judaism is very, very unlikely. All the texts that we have about what Jews believed uh, 
assumed a physical resurrection, and this is said very clearly in books like 2nd and 4th Maccabees. In fact, one of these events, one of these texts, has seven sons being killed at the same time, in sequence, mutilated, one after another. And when the third son goes to be mutilated, he sticks out his hands and he sticks out his tongue and he says, you can have these because one day God is going to give them back to me. That's a pretty physical take on resurrection. And so, so it's granted that the resurrection body, the glorified God, is, is pictured as being, you know, not just physical, it's not just matter, but there is something physical about it. And Paul defended that teaching and doctrine in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, he inherited that view into Christianity from his Pharisaical background, which was rooted in the Jewish view of resurrection. So um, the idea of a spiritual resurrection uh, in the Christian faith uh, has to not only ignore the New Testament evidence, it has to ignore the Jewish roots that feed into the New Testament. Talk about 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, this is an important thing that goes right straight back to the time when Jesus uh, resurrected and uh, not too far after that. And tell them what it says. Well, the beginning has actually one of these doctrinal summaries that we've been talking about that says, you know, Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried on the third day and he was raised according to the scripture, and the pictures of an empty tomb and appearances of physical raised Jesus. And Paul is honest enough to say in the midst of this chapter, if Jesus is not raised, we are the most pitied of all men, because what he's saying is we have believed in effect a lie and we've hoped for a lie. So Paul is very clear about how central an actual resurrection is to the hope of the Christian faith because part of the hope of the Christian faith is an unbroken, unceasing relationship with the living God that lasts forever. And that requires a resurrection to take place. Yeah, if you just took the list of people that are in 1 Corinthians 15, which goes back how far? You mean in terms of where it popped? The date? The date, well, it's talking about appearances that happen immediately. It's Paul writing in the, in, in the mid to late 50s but it reflects his experience in the passing on of tradition that probably happened somewhere in the 30s. So we're within years of, of the actual event. And the list of people that was given to him that were eyewitnesses is over 500 people. Somebody's yeah, added it up. Even at one time, 500 people. Yeah. yeah. 500 people at one time saw Jesus, That's but if right. you list, put all the guys, it was 515 or something like that. If you gave them each just 15 minutes in court, mm -hmm. it would be uh, 129 hours mm -hmm. or five straight. You wouldn't straight, want to be on that jury. <laughs> five straight days of testimony, <laughs> yeah. okay? Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be, you know, yeah. who would say after hearing 129 hours of testimony, mm -hmm. ah, nothing really happened. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't work. All right, let's roll on to the next one. Didn't Emperor Constantine invent the deity of Christ in 325 at the Council of Nicaea? And before that, the Christians thought of Jesus like any other man. That one is another one that's just simply dead wrong. Uh, and we have a letter that uh, Pliny the Younger wrote to Emperor Trajan in the second decade of the second century. Pliny was, uh, was governor of what is now central Turkey, an area called Bithynia. And he writes a letter, and he's dealing with persecuted Christians. He's trying to figure out when he can res if he can restore Christians that he's persecuted if they do certain things. Can he forgive them? Can, can they get clemency from the state? And he writes and he says, I've basically been told that a real Christian won't bow the knee before the statue of Caesar. And, and, and we've taken a look at their worship services, and when we go into their worship services, they sing hymns to Jesus as God, to Christ as God. It has the teaching of the worship service of the church in Turkey, miles away from Israel, in the early 2nd century. And, and so we know that the early church, vast segments of it, of course we knew this from our documents as it is anyway, uh, are worshiping a deified Jesus. Constantine did not put an imprimatur on that view of Jesus. Uh, let's say it this way. Christianity didn't become what it is because of Constantine. Constantine became what he was because of Christianity. I love that. Let me, let me add, if I could, that you have the biblical manuscripts themselves, that on John 1.1 1, 1, we've got P66, P75, two very early papyri, that are uh, uh, well over 100 years earlier than Constantine. And they say exactly what all the other manuscripts say, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if Constantine invented the deity of Christ, that means he had to have lived in the second century. I don't think he was quite that old. <laughs> Sometimes you get a variation of the argument that says that Constantine is responsible for the makeup of the canon or something like that. But again, as we've already covered, that's not the case either. What Constantine did do is he embraced Christianity, which did give it a an open door across the, for, the Roman Empire that, that he was head of and certainly was responsible for its solidifying its position 
at, as the religion of, of what became Europe. There's no doubt about that. But he isn't responsible for the theological content. All right, next question. Uh, how do we know that the church scribes didn't tamper with the text? So what we've got now is what, not what the apostles wrote. Well, actually, we do know that they did tamper with the text at times. And the, the primary thing that they did in terms of changing the text was to make it more explicit. Uh, for example, in Mark chapter 6 through 8, there's 89 verses in a row in which Jesus is not once mentioned by name or title. And so the scribes had a tendency to want to add words, and so in three different places they add the name Jesus or call him Lord so that people can understand who they're talking Especially about. Especially in lectionaries. Yeah, exactly, in lectionaries, in these liturgical books that the church would be reading week after week in terms of this is the passage you read for this week. You can't just start out with he did this, the he has to be named. So they, they did change the text, but over a 1,400-year period of copying of manuscripts, the manuscripts grew only by 2%. Now, that's not the kind of investment I think anybody would ever want to uh, pool in. It's, it's not going to make much money. But 2% growth of the text over 1,400 years is not that substantial of a change. There are differences, that's true, but they don't affect any of these key doctrines that we're dealing with. Yeah, let's go. we got only about a minute 30 left, and that is, doesn't the New Testament disagree with itself? For example, don't Paul and Peter disagree with each other in Galatians? They do disagree with one another in Galatians, but they also extend to one another the right hand of fellowship in terms of what their theology teaches. What they were disagreeing about is how Jews and Gentiles should get along. What they agreed about was the idea that Jesus taught things like the golden rule and that the faith, the faith that gathered one around Jesus meant that people had to live in a certain way. They, they, they absolutely overlap in that area. Summarize these conversation stoppers and give advice to Christians. What should they do? Well, the first thing I think Christians should do is just is, is get up to speed, if I can say it that way. This series has been designed to get you quickly up to speed, to give you some handles, to re read some good material that's out there that discusses these areas so that you're able to have a conversation. And have a conversation. Don't have an argument. Exactly. Uh, listen to where the other person is coming from when they ask their questions. In many cases, all they're doing is raising sincere questions because they've heard something on television or they've read something in a book. And so engage them, don't fight with them. You're not going to win a fight, uh, so you want to engage them. And I think the third thing is learn to explain your Christian faith, not only in terms of your personal experience, but in terms of the historical rootage that the Christian faith has and that the Christian faith has historically left itself open for. Guys, I think it's a high privilege to be able to talk with you guys and have you as guests on the program and I know that the folks that are listening have benefited greatly from this. Thank you and thank you for your new book, Dethroning Jesus. <laughs>